So good evening. Thank you for joining and thank you to all of our speakers who are here with us this evening. Welcome all to the LaFontaine Commercial Fertilizer Prohibition Webinar. I'm Melissa Carruthers, Risk Management Official and Inspector at the Severn Sound Environmental Association, uh, also known as the SSEA, and at the Township of Tiny, and I'll be your host for this evening. For those of you who may not be aware of who the SSEA is, we are a joint municipal services board under the Municipal Act. We represent eight municipalities and are dedicated to the management, monitoring, and stewardship of the Severn Sound area. Our mission is we are committed to ensuring exceptional environmental quality and exemplary stewardship of the Severn Sound area through sound science collaboration and partnership. We have a great lineup of speakers for you this evening. So it's including myself, representatives from the Township of Tiny, Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, a local agricultural community, and the Guelph Turfgrass Institute. We're all here to talk to you tonight about the prohibition of commercial fertilizer in the LaFontaine area. We would like to start by acknowledging the lands within the LaFontaine area are the traditional and treaty territory of the Anishinaabe people, now known as the Chippewa Tri-Council, comprised of Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Island First Nation. This territory is within the Pre-Confederation Treaty 5 and Treaty 16, and included within the Williams Treaties of 1923. The heart of Georgian Bay was once the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and is now home to many Indigenous people, including the Anishinaabe and many citizens of the Métis Nation of Ontario. We respectfully acknowledge that we are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters, and that we continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. So before we get started uh, with this great lineup of speakers, a few housekeeping items to bring to your attention. So uh, as you know, uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, the intention is that we will upload it to the SSEA YouTube channel after the fact. Uh, we will be holding questions until the end, uh, but you can add your questions at any time. So to do so at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a Q&A button and also a chat. Uh, please feel free to add your, your questions in there at any time. Uh, we do have Nicole working away in the background. She'll be monitoring this for us tonight. Another option is when we do get to the Q&A portion of, of, the, of the session, uh, you can raise your hand. So again, there's a button at the bottom and then we can unmute you and you can speak to us and, and ask your questions that way. Uh, if we run out of time to get through all the questions, we will follow up by email to make sure everything is answered. Uh, we do have a very full agenda for you this evening. So to hold questions to the end, we're hoping that this will keep us, uh, stay us better on track. Uh, also, you might find that your, your question may be answered by another speaker later on. A quick note, so we will be uh, implementing a zero tolerance policy for aggressive or harassing behavior. Uh, if this happens, you will be removed from the meeting. So tonight is meant to be a safe sharing space and an opportunity for education and outreach. And lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge that some of you on the call this evening uh, who are um, or who are watching after the fact uh, may not live in the LaFontaine area. And I just wanted to reiterate the prohibition of commercial fertilizer only applies in the LaFontaine area within the township of Tiny. So it's not a, a blanketed uh, prohibition across the province or even across uh, the Severn Sound watershed. So with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna be up first. Uh, so just give me a moment here to share my screen. All right, so this presentation, it'll be a high level. Uh, it's an overview of the drinking water source protection program, what it is, how it works, and why you may be impacted. So to start at the very beginning, what is source water? So as the slide states, source water is the water from streams, lakes, rivers, or underground aquifers used to supply prob public and private drinking water systems. It comes from two sources, surface or groundwater. And when we talk about the drinking water source protection program, it is the protection of municipal drinking water sources for overuse and contamination. The drinking water source protection program gets its power from the Clean Water Act, which is provincial legislation. It is the first step in Ontario's multi-barrier approach to protecting municipal drinking water sources. Although source water fits into provincial legislation, it's being implemented across the province on a local level through local source protection plans. There are 19 source protection regions in the province, and we are a part of the South Georgian Bay Lake Simcoe source protection region. There are two key vulnerable areas that were created as part of the source protection process. They are called wellhead protection areas or WAPAs and intake protection zones or IPZs. 
Wapas are areas surrounding a municipal well, and the size of them is determined by how quickly water travels underground to a municipal well and is measured in years. Very similar, an intake protection zone is the area on the water and land surrounding a municipal surface water intake. The size of each zone is determined by how quickly water flows to the intake in hours. WAPAs and IPZs were modeled by qualified professionals using the best available science and done in accordance with technical rules set out by the province. A key thing to note about this program is it only applies within these vulnerable areas. Within the township of Tiny, there are only wellhead protection areas. The graphic on the right shows the location of these WAPAs. There are also two well, WAPAs or well, uh, wellhead protection areas that have additional protections in place because they are issue contributing areas within the township of Tiny. An issue contributing area or ICA is an area that was defined based on a parameter in the raw drinking water that will limit the ability of the water to serve as a drinking water source either now or in the future. The LaFontaine nitrate ICA pictured in the upper left corner is the uh, area affected by the prohibition that we are here to talk about tonight. Uh, just for, for your reference, Robert Street is an ICA for trichloroethylene or a heavy chemical. There are 22 prescribed drinking water threats under the Clean Water Act, which are addressed through the program. 20 of those deals with impacts on water quality and two deal with water quantity. The threats span multiple sectors, such as municipal, industrial, residential, and agricultural, so nobody is really exempt. So how are we actually protecting the source water? So a source protection plan is a document that contains a range of policies that aim to manage and eliminate existing and future significant drinking water threats within local vulnerable areas. As previously mentioned, each source protection region has its own local source protection plan, and our plan was approved by the then Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and became effective in 2015. On the screen is an example of how the plan and policies are laid out. On the right is an example of threat number eight, which is related to the application of commercial fertilizer to land, the reason we are here today. However, they are all laid out the same. They start with a definition or text for context purposes and have a summary chart of what circumstances would be required to result in a significant drinking water threat. However, as it's noted in the footnote, uh, this is for guidance only and to really dive into if a threat would be significant or not, you need to be looking into the table of circumstances and that's something we will not be covering today. As you can see, commercial fertilizer is defined as a manufactured substance containing nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium and other plant food intended for use as a plant nutrient. And in the LaFontaine area, we are mostly concerned about the nitrogen in that fertilizer. So it's followed by the policies around that threat, which includes who implements, how, and a high level of what needs to be done. So as you can see, it's a very prescriptive program. So uh, now what you can see on the screen, it's the policy that is dictating the prohibition of commercial fertilizer to land on the residential properties in the LaFontaine area. So for reference, uh, that is uh, policy FERT ICA2, and it will remain in effect in perpetuity or until such time that the nitrate levels in the municipal drinking water are low enough to not warrant these actions. You will hear a little later tonight from a local farmer what policies they are bound by and what that means to them. A question you may be asking is how will this be enforced? So this will be done in a couple different ways. Uh, there's, there most likely will be some planned or drop in inspections. Uh, also will be done on a complaint basis. A subsequent question may be, are there any fines for not complying? The answer to that is yes. As you can see from the screen under section 106 of the Clean Water Act, for an individual with a first conviction, the fine could be up to 25,000 per day. In the package that was sent to the impacted residents, was a tracking sheet to aid in these inspections. Uh, if, you've, if you've misplaced it or would like another, please feel free to reach out to me. So the Drinking Water Source Protection Program is backed by science and has been created under the Clean Water Act. There are a few other documents you might be interested in. The assessment reports lay out the science of how the wellhead protection areas and intake protection zones came to be. There's an assessment report for each of the four watersheds within our region and are broken down by municipality and then by water supply. They contain all the information gained to evaluate the drinking water sources, such as mapping, threat counts, and background on each water supply, how they were modeled, et cetera. 
If you have any questions about a specific water supply, this is the place to look. There is also an explanatory document, so this provides a rationale of how each policy came to be. And all of this is done in accordance with the director's technical rules for assessment reports under the Clean Water Act. Uh, just a quick note, so if you are going to dive into those, those assessment reports, so we're talking about the LaFontaine area here tonight, but in those assessment reports, when they were written, uh, it was known as two different systems, so Georgian Sands and LaFontaine, so there is still two sections in those assessment reports. So who is responsible for protecting source water? The Region Source Protection Committee, comprised of local, municipal, public, economic, and First Nations representative, created our source protection plan. It is their responsibility to evaluate and update it. It is the responsibility of the Source Protection Authority staff, in this case the SSEA, to monitor source water activities, provide education and outreach support materials, as well as support implementing bodies. The risk management official or inspector, which is myself, is responsible for working with landowners to identify and mitigate the risk to municipal supplies. Municipal staff are responsible for coordinating with their risk management official or inspector if development is occurring on the property located in a vulnerable area, as well as, as implementing additional policies such, such as a septic reinspection program. And finally, source water protection flows right down to property owners and managers, developers and builders to ensure they are making responsible choices in vulnerable areas. In short, it's the team effort and we all have a role to play. So thank you for your time. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to hold questions to the end, but please, uh, please add any that you have at any point. Use it the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen uh, or you know, hold tight and when we get to the um, Q&A section, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, next up uh, for this evening, I'd like to welcome Rebecca Raymond. She's the water supervisor from the Township of Tiny. Uh, she'll be providing an overview on local nitrate levels, testing, and well operations. Take it away, Rebecca. I'm the water supervisor for the Township of Tiny Water Department, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we do. And basically, we collect samples uh, every two weeks, which is above the uh, ministry requirements for, uh, sorry, trying to share this here. For LaFontaine, it used to be two separate systems, the LaFontaine system and the Georgian Sand system, and they have been combined. But the LaFontaine uh, original system was the one that had significant nitrates. And as you can see by this trend, our nitrates are coming down slowly. They're still not uh, the red line is the 10 milligrams per liter, which is the maximum that we're allowed. And this is raw water, not the blended water that goes out to the residents. But so uh, over the last few years, and I would contribute this a lot to the, the farmers, the community, everybody working together to uh, protect our source water. So for these ones, the results are coming down, uh, our blended water, the results are typically around eight parts per million. But uh, in neighboring, this is uh, one of our other systems, in neighboring systems, we find that the nitrates are slowly increasing. So I think we need to continue all of our uh, sampling and uh, efforts in, in the township to keep the nitrate levels at a manageable level. Um, sorry. We, uh, we continue to sample bi-weekly uh, when there was a little blip, just trying to go back here. Sorry. Uh, we did have that little blip uh, in the spring, summer, uh, this year that we attributed to um, potentially a lab error as we have not had any other samples that show an increase. And right after that, it continued to trend down. So I do not think that uh, that was an accurate sample from our system. And I think that is 
pretty much all I have. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, interesting to hear what the township is doing uh, regarding the distribution of water to local residents. So thank you very much. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Karen Cavallotti. She's the Safe Water Program Manager at the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. Uh, she'll be presenting on the health impacts of nitrogen, or sorry, nitrates. Uh, Karen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just going to get this. Going. Hi, everyone. Um, I am the program manager for Safe Water at the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the health effects of nitrates and in particular in drinking water. So recognizing that our exposure to nitrates can come through um, either our uh, diet, so it can come through food, or through water that contains these chemicals. Um, some of the dietary sources, for example, can include vegetables, fruits, processed meats, like hot dogs, sausages, and deli meats. But today we're gonna to focus more on the drinking water side of it. So uh, just to note that most people um, who um, are exposed, exposed to nitrates are really not exposed at high levels that would ever cause um, any real health problems. Uh, the issue with nitrates is that when it gets and starts creeping above the maximum acceptable concentration, so that's that MAC you're seeing on the slide, uh, that's when it becomes a potential risk for infants under the age of six months. And so when the level of nitrate starts to exceed that level, uh, we recommend not using that water to prepare infant formula or other foods for infants. So what happens is that uh, we have hemoglobin, okay, which is a, a protein in our red blood cells that carries oxygen. And methemoglobin is the form of hemoglobin that can't carry oxygen. So nitrate can turn hemoglobin into methemoglobin. So when infants ingest elevated nitrates, um, at, like just to note that um, infants don't have the ability to digest, they don't have the same digestive um, enzymes that um, older infants and children and adults do. So when they ingest elevated nitrates, um, basically what happens is that could lead to the, to, to the production of met hemoglobin and then the tissues can't get enough oxygen. So some of the signs and symptoms um, of met hemoglobinemia or uh, quote unquote blue baby syndrome include um, the skin turning sort of a bluish color. There's rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath. It could be nausea, diarrhea, um, lethargy, even a loss of consciousness. So it can be very, very serious for um, infants who are less than six months of age. So um, what can we do? So when it comes to drinking water, we know that municipal water is already heavily monitored, monitored for us. So at a bare minimum, every municipal drinking water system is tested every three months for nitrates. Now there are systems like uh, LaFontaine and others um, who have either a history of increased nitrates or, or um, periodic spikes or an increasing trend that is showing that the nitrates are increasing in the, um, uh, in the aquifers or in the, in the surrounding area, then they will also be increasing their sample frequency. So when Rebecca mentioned that they are now sampling every two weeks, that would be a good example of um, how the municipalities are taking extra steps to make sure that we're all protected um, and the water's tested for nitrates. So prevention, uh, not everybody, particularly in the LaFontaine area, is necessarily serviced by municipal water. So uh, the best prevention is to have your uh, well water tested to know what the level of nitrate is in your water. And if the nitrates are elevated, um, and you can install a treatment system. Uh, treatment systems like reverse osmosis or ion exchange are um, uh, well known to remove nitrates in drinking water uh, or at least lower them um, or use an alternative source of water. And this is all very, um, very, very focused in particular for um, infants who are bottle fed. 
Um, and then just to note that breastfeeding is safe. So even if you are in an area or you're ingesting through your diet, a lot of nitrates, that breastfeeding is always the safest. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Karen. That was a very informative presentation. Our next speaker will be Paul Maurice, owner and farmer at Firms Mompura Farms here in the LaFontaine area. He is speaking as a representative of the local agricultural community and requirements they are fulfilling. Thank you, Nicole. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I mean, pleased to be able to give you just a few notes on what we are doing here in the LaFontaine area when it comes to the agricultural community in minimizing any risk that we have to the high nitrate levels. So my name is Paul Maurice and I farm on the 15th concession here in, in Tiny Township, just uh, one uh, concession south of LaFontaine. Back uh, when the, uh, the high nitrate levels were identified, the uh, all farmers that were, uh, were within the wellhead protection area were identified and we got together and we agreed to uh, come up with a plan and, and to minimize any risk that we that could happen to the uh, water table. If we could go to the second slide, please. So as Melissa had mentioned a while ago, we all agreed uh, to uh, come up with the, a plan that we could all manage. And basically uh, in this plan, it is the best management practices that we can use. And, and I have to say that these practices are not new. They are practices that we um, uh, had been using, but we are just making sure that we um, take full advantage of, of these plans and practices, um, again, to minimize any risk. And also the one th important thing out of this is, is also to mention that even though these uh, these practices are used within the uh, the wellhead area, we are using this throughout our, our farm. So it's not only the, the immediate area that it, these plans are being used in or practices, but all over. So um, just it, it better for the, the whole area. Next slide, please. So what has this all entailed for the farmers that are involved? The, within the wellhead management area, there are nine farmers that were identified. And uh, so we have agreed to basically follow uh, what is known as the 4R nutrient management plan. And the uh, so out of the, the four R's stand for the right source, using the right uh, uh, fertilizer uh, sources to grow the crop, applying it at the right time, at, at the right rate, the right time and the right place. So in order to be able to do this, we are using um, uh, soil tests uh, that are, are sent to the lab and analyzed. We know what nutrients are required to grow a crop. So according to the soil test results, we base the, um, the uh, requirements that are needed to grow the crop so that we make sure that we are applying the proper fertilizer and, um, and not applying more than what we are needing, but the, to, to uh, take the fullest extent of the, um, of the nutrients. Some of the stuff that we've been doing on that, we've been uh, applying what we are calling split applications to make sure that the uh, there's no leaching from the uh, um, fertilizers. And the uh, it's a uh, nitrogen loss inhibitors that we're applying to the fertilizer, makes it a slow release so that the plant takes up the, the nutrient and that uh, we make sure that it is not being lost. When we're to the, uh, taking the soil samples and we're coming up with the nutrient uh, fertilizer uh, requirements, we are also using a certified crop advisor. These people have been trained and uh, to be able to uh, look at these analysis and make sure that the proper um, um, fertilizers are being used to their, their best uh, advantage. One of the things that we have um, introduced and um, in the last few years is planting cover crops. The big advantage of the, the uh, cover crops is that it keeps the microbial action working in the soil and the, we keep the soil as live as, as possible. We minimize wind and water erosion and uh, it adds organic matter back into the soil. All of this stuff here has been stuff that we've been doing over the years, but we are just paying uh, closer attention to making sure that everything is done properly. 
and probably one of the bigger things that um, uh, has taken place within this plan is being able to track what we're doing and where we're doing it and making sure that is, it is properly recorded. But in a nutshell, that is what we are doing in the agricultural community to be able to minimize any risk in the water system. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for sharing the actions undertaken by our local agricultural community to help protect drinking water and to ensure a sustainable food source for all of us. Uh, our last speaker of the night will be Dr. Eric Lyons. He's the director of the Guelph Turfgrass Institute and professor at the University of Guelph. He'll be presenting on alternatives to commercial fertilizer. So please join me in welcoming Eric. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping you can see the first slide. You can see it, I hope. Um, anyway, I am here to talk to you about nitrogen and turf grasses and what you can maybe do uh, in light of not being able to apply commercial fertilizers. So I want to start, hmm, he's advanced. There we go. I want to start talking about why we have urban plants, why we're there. Just real quick, plants prevent runoff. All plants prevent runoff. Plants prevent erosion all plants, turf grass included. They produce oxygen, they reduce urban heating through evapotranspiration, it's not just shade. So they actually, the evapotranspiration cools our cities. They also all sequester carbon. Uh, most turf grasses in a home lawn setting also sequester carbon, even though we mow them and do all those other things. But there is one thing that's special about turf grasses and that's why we use them, is you can play on it. It's a place to gather, it's a place to play, it's a place to build community. You can have your neighbors over and you don't have to have a very expensive deck or anything. You can do it right there on there. And we all learned this a lot during COVID. This is, you know, my family during COVID playing, putting golf in our backyard, going to an area with large turf grass areas and playing with the trees. Um, so one of the, you know, it's, we have green spaces in our communities for the human experience and to improve our lives. And that's University of Guelph's model is to improve life. So that's why I'm talking about it. Um, if you're gonna use your turf grass, you need growth. So I get called out a lot to look at situations and uh, here's a situation where they kept watering it, kept watering it and saying, you know, they, they, they you know, they need more water because the turf's not growing. And then a dog uh, did its business in the middle there and it turned lush and green and filled in. And it's just like, okay, they don't need more water. And the key there is to make sure you don't over deliver something that it doesn't need. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that turf grasses don't need nitrogen because they do, but let's make good choices moving forward so that we can have what we want, a place to play, a place to gather, and a place that's aesthetically somewhat pleasing. And you don't end up with what I ended up one time in my backyard after many years of neglect, all weeds, mostly mud as soon as the first frost came because they would die back. And so a typical lawn mix that we have is Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and fine fescue. That's what we sell here in Ontario primarily. A low input lawn, and this includes all the trademarked ones such as Eco Lawn or something like that, they're primarily a fine fescue based lawn. And fine fescues grow in sandy soils with low nitrogen, and so they're pretty good for maintaining let, you know, a, a lawn where you can't put down commercial fertilizers. I always avoid trademark names when I talk about them. What you want is a fine fescue lawn. You don't need a particular trademark name. Uh, but here's something to remember about these. The Kentucky bluegrass is wear tolerant and survives drought through dormancy. It's winter hardy, it's, but it's susceptible to chinch bugs. Our perennial ryegrass, not quite as hardy, resistant to chinch bug. That's why they go well together. The issue with fine fescues is they have little wear tolerance. They don't like to be walked on. They don't like to be played on. So if you're going to go with a low input lawn, you're going to be able to use it a lot less. And, and I'm going to talk about clovers in a little bit too, and they can even be used less than fine fescue. So you have to combine some things. Um, they're not very heat tolerant. Like when you mow your grass on a hot day, you will see the tire tracks from your mower. Um, I have a, I'll show you my lawn in a little bit, and it's resistant to chinch bug. I have a fine fescue front yard. I don't like mowing and I mowed it four times this summer. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when you make choices, you're making choices about use and wear, inputs, water use, and you might want to use legumes such as clover or 
alternative legumes. So this is my front yard and it's mostly fine fescue. You'll see there's almost no weeds in it. I have to constantly overseed it with fine fescue to keep it juvenile and keep it going, but it's pretty thin and wispy and I've never applied nitrogen to the front yard. Uh, I've lived there over nine years and that's what I got. It was a slow transition from the yard that was there when I got there because it was a, that three-way mix. And I just started overseeding with fine fescue, not adding nitrogen, not watering it. And eventually the weeds started going away because there wasn't enough nitrogen for them to grow either. It can be done is my point. Now, where we have our garden, we can water our bedding plants in the drought time. So right here, I have basically a nice combination of white clover and fine fescue. It, it, it's really nice. It, it sticks out. Um, it's green all the time because it has enough nitrogen. The issue with it is the white clover can't survive in the bulk of my yard because it won't survive the drought. I would have to rescue it with some water. And I'll show you a yard or a lawn that was put in by one of my neighbors. This is you know, white clover or micro clover. And they put that in their front yard and it did really well for a couple of years. And then they had a drought. We drought restrictions came in. They didn't water it before the drought restrictions on water. And now it's mostly just dead. So the key here is if you're going to go with clover, you have to pay attention to your watering schedule. And if you know that a big drought's coming and you're allowed to water once a week, water once a week. Uh, I never suggest doing what my neighbor did, which is saying going with 100% of one of just the clover. You want to mix. You want to mix in your fine fescue with your clover to make it work. If you do it just clover, if you get a bad summer with a lot of drought and the city can't, says you can't water, it will die off. Whereas your turf grasses go dormant and they survive. You know, this neighbor also put in gravel here and a zero escape and there's lots of weeds in it and the kids can't play on it. So that's why I always say do this. Now, clover has much less wear tolerant than fine fescue, another reason to mix them. One thing I want to remind everyone of is anytime we talk about fertilization of plants, nitrogen's the base. It's the thing that the plant needs the most. So if you're going to try to put some fertilizers down in the form of a compost that has fertilizer, not a, not a store-bought compost, but an actual compost that you're making yourself, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how to think about fertility for you if you're going to try to do that. First of all, nitrogen is, you know, Basically, the more you want it to grow, the more nitrogen you have. So the idea here is slow the growth. You have to mow it less often. You have to let water it less often. That's not a bad thing for most of us. You need small amounts when growing, and that's what I'm going to focus on you. So there's a ban on commercial fertilizers, but any nitrogen source can leach. It doesn't, you know, the nature, the soil physics doesn't know whether it was made in a factory or made in your backyard in a compost pile. Doesn't know. So the key here is to make sure that you protect that too. Also, if you do have a big compost pile, make sure there's plastic underneath it so the nitrogen from the compost pile cannot leach. Um, and then you have phosphorus and potassium, and you have to be careful with those. And this is just because it's fall, I thought I'd throw this in here. Uh, turf grass is not growing in the fall. So September, October, November, they added different amounts of nitrogen. And when they added a lot more nitrogen in in November, they got no more growth. When they added nitrogen in October, they got no more growth. The only time they got more growth from nitrogen was in September. And this was a place that's slightly more warm than here. It's Lansing, Michigan. So, or Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, probably. So same thing in the second year, run two. They don't grow late in the season. So don't put your compost down now. Put it down in the spring when the grass is growing. In fact, I'd wait till late spring because there'll probably be plenty of nitrogen because of the microbes in the spring. And this also shows that when you put down nitrogen late, they can't recover it back in the plant. It disappears. The earlier you put it down, the more the plant takes up. So that's something you definitely want to be aware of. Uh, limit, you got to limit your nitrogen or your compost applications to what the plants can take up. One thing I say is return your clippings. That will reduce the need. Nitrogen will escape if plants can't take it up regardless of the source. Cool temperatures, drought, it escapes when the rain returns and the turf is still dormant. So you don't, you don't want to use it at that time either. I also want to point, about, point out that it's important to keep your lawn healthy because there's other issues in the Lake Simcoe region, such as phosphorus loading. Now, 
One of the things that's a huge influence on this, we did some studies a year ago, is leaf fall. Make sure that your leaves are gathered and not going into the storm sewers and runoff. And also your lawn, this is a clover lawn that died because of drought because it wasn't maintained. There's lots of particulate matter coming off this lawn into our storm sewers, and we want to prevent that. So one thing that I'm just going to show you real quick is if you want to present, prevent other sorts of pollution, having a lawn is a good idea. It's a lot better than hardscapes. It's a lot better than a lot of other things. And this just shows putting a little bit of nitrogen down. So there's no fertilizer and they lost 0 0.09 phosphorus with just a little bit of N and K nitrogen K, and this could be in compost form, still no fertilizer, they actually reduced it because what they did is they increased plant cover, which means they could use their lawn a little bit more and also less phosphorus ran off from the lawn. So I am going to encourage you to maintain your lawn and not give up on it, but try to incorporate legumes, use fine fescues to prevent runoff and low input. And so with that, I'm going to thank you. And I think I didn't go too far over, I don't know. Nope, perfect time. Yeah, there's still have a we have a few more minutes. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. That was uh, those are some really great tips and some good uh, good information to share. Thank you. Uh, so that uh, that brings us to our Q and A portion of the program. So we're done with the sort of formal uh, presentation part. Uh, if you haven't already done so, if you've got some questions, please uh, please add those into the Q and A. Uh, again, uh, there's a button at the bottom of your screen, uh, or you can also raise your hand, uh, and we'll call on you that way. Um, uh, again, just as a reminder, so uh, if we don't get to all the questions, we do have your email addresses uh, from your registrations. Um, so if we don't get to them all, we will be following up just to make sure that they are answered. Um, and, and maybe if I can just call on Nicole, if you wouldn't mind just uh, if there's any questions in the in the um, chat or Q&A, uh, if you wouldn't mind just uh, reading some of those out, please. Yes, absolutely. And actually, sorry, sorry, quickly, just uh, to the other um, presenters, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning your cameras on and we'll... Uh, uh, we'll just have a little discussion here. Right, sorry, take it away, Nicole. Um, so I have a few for Rebecca first. Um, can you give us a brief history of why nitrate levels became high in the first place? Or Melissa and Rebecca can probably answer that one. Uh, I can take a stab at it and then uh, Rebecca, okay. if you want to jump in. Um, so I think that's a really tricky question to answer. Um, as far as I've known, the nitrate levels in the system have always been fairly high. Um, we can't really point it to any one source or industry, um, but the, the general overall thought is possibly from historical practices and uses. Uh, we're just sort of um, bearing the brunt of many, many years ago. So practices from all industries have changed over the, over the you know, even the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and it's, it's uh, thought to be a historic um, input. Uh, Rebecca, anything to add to that? I, they've been higher than since I've been at the township in the last 20 years. I'm, it's really hard to say what the source is. We don't know. I mean, given the WAPA and how long it takes for the nitrates to get to our wells, it's hard to say what was being done that many years ago. <laughs> and actually, I, I realize this probably isn't part of the question, but maybe I'll just quickly touch on that. So when it comes to the wellhead protection areas, the furthest area away from the well is a 25 year time of travel. So we are dealing with um, anywhere from a, a you know, 100 meters to two years, five year, 10 year, 25 years. So we are dealing with longer timeframes of travel. Um, I will share that uh, we did try to look into the nitrate levels, um, I think about five or six years ago now, and we did a, a bit of a research study um, and it, depending on the well, so we did have some consultants that did some modeling uh, and it showed that it could take anywhere from 17 to 38 years to show the difference. Uh, so if we put something on the landscape today, it might take 17 to 38 years, depending on the well within the system to show in those municipal systems. So we are dealing with some longer timeframes uh, in this area. Great, thank you. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Um, Nicole, next question, please. Definitely. So the next one's um, for Karen. Uh, it was brought up during her presentation. Um, how about, oh, I'm sorry, my internet's unstable. Melissa, can you still hear me? I can, yes, I can still hear okay. you, yep. 
Um, how about dogs? I have oh, had... You're cutting out, so I think I can ask it. Um, so the question was, um, how about dogs? So they've had three dog dogs die of cancer. Uh, maybe if you can speak to um, maybe a bit of the health risk to, to animals instead of human. Well, uh, we're definitely more human health. We would refer normally to um, our animal health experts for that type of question. But what I will say is that the results that we've seen in recent years from the LaFontaine system, uh, you know, these little small periodic spikes that occur um, are not expected to have any health effects to the rest of the population. Um, so the way that the drinking water standards are set, they're set to be very, very protective of the most vulnerable population, which um, in this case are very, very young infants. So I would say that there's probably very negligible risks or association with those dogs having cancer. Thank you, Karen. Um, go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, I can do the next one. Um, uh, back to Rebecca. What is blended water? I realized after I was speaking that I used that term and never <laughs> explained it. So basically, uh, any of our wells that have higher nitrates, either above uh, the maximum limit of 10 milligrams per liter, which aren't any at the moment, but uh, there was some that were over 10. And so we would take water from wells that are lower, say five, and then blend those two together so that the the water going out to the public uh, sits around eight. So that's the blended is just we blend from different uh, from different systems, different wells in order to get those uh, levels below the maximum level for the residents. Great, thanks, Rebecca. Um, another one. I think we have two more for you. Um, can nitrate be taken out of the water? So we did an EA about 12 years ago when the nitrates were first climbing above the limit and the cost and the waste associated with taking the nitrates out of a municipal system is quite cost prohibitive. And the waste product, so you're wasting uh, almost as much water as you're making with the removal of nitrates which causes a whole bunch of different issues with uh, how do you get rid of that? And then how do you get the nitrates out of that wastewater? So we have found that blending the water was the best way to, to get rid of it versus removing it. Great, thanks, Rebecca. Karen, did you have a question about that? No, I didn't have a question, but I just had a comment um, because, uh, you know, nitrates can be lowered and removed um, like at a residential um, scale. So there are residential scale treatment systems that you can install uh, like reverse osmosis. So you could have a dedicated tap uh, in your kitchen that is strictly used for drinking and preparing foods um, that would remove nitrates. Um, Again, there's um, ion exchange units. And what that means is kind of like a water softener, how water, how the salt will exchange um, ions and then thereby reduce the hardness and create soft water. So the same kind of system that can reduce uh, or, or remove nitrates, but we would always recommend that you seek the consultation of a water treatment specialist so they can do a full um, test on your water to determine like lots of different elements that might affect the treatment, but uh, it, it's definitely possible and it's very effective and uh, it's not, uh, it's definitely not cost prohibitive. It's not, um, it's not necessarily um, cheap, but uh, it's definitely something that, you know, it's a, um, like a one-time purchase that's very, um, you know, that could be anywhere from three to say $600, but then the upkeep is a lot less expensive. It's just the initial, it's, it's the buying the equipment and having it installed that costs the most. Thanks, Karen, that's very interesting. Um, there also looks to have been a spike last year around the same time. Sorry, this is um, regarding Rebecca's presentation. It seems a bit coincidental, they say. So on, I'm not sure how big the numbers were on that uh, chart, but those samples go back to 2018. 
And that last blip was in 2019. So that would have been about four years ago, uh, not last year. Great, thanks Rebecca. And that concludes all the questions. Back to you, Melissa. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, so like Nicole said, that, so that's all the questions that we've got sitting in the Q&A. Uh, maybe we'll just give it a few moments. So if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to type them or click on the raise hand button and uh, we can get some questions answered. Uh, so uh, I don't have any elevator music or anything to fill the time, but we'll just give it a, a minute or so here and see if anything else comes through the chat. And maybe I'll, uh, while, while we're waiting on that, so if you have any additional questions, um, maybe I'm just going to pop back up um, um, some contact information. So feel free, if you've thought about something after the fact, uh, you've got some questions, um, feel free to contact myself, uh, and then we can, uh, we can work on getting those questions out. Um, so Nicole, maybe just correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not seeing anything. I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, anything on your side? No, nope, no hands up. Okay, so we, uh, we're a little early, maybe not a bad thing in the, on this evening, but uh, that brings us to the end of our, uh, of our session this evening. Uh, I just wanted to thank all of you for taking time out of your evening, joining us. Uh, super huge special thank you to all of our speakers for joining and sharing such valuable information. Uh, I know I actually learned a lot tonight as well, so that's always great. Um, oh, uh, oh, we got one last question coming through. So it says, why aren't all residential people in the area all prohibited from using fertilizer? Uh, great questions. Uh, so really, like we said, so the fertilizer, the prohibition is only in the LaFontaine area. It is really bound back to the Clean Water Act it, it, because the nitrate levels are in the municipal well uh, at a bit of a, a, an issue level. Uh, that's not the case in any of the other systems currently, uh, which is why the ban is only in this area. I hope that answers the question for you. Do you want to outline that? Go back to the slide showing the ICA and we can outline the area a bit. Sure. Um, actually. Also map maps of the area were sent out with the letters um, earlier this month. That's right. So I'm just going to stop sharing just so I, you're not, uh, and I'll put go back to that screen for a second. Okay, yes, yeah, so like Nicole mentioned, so that's uh, the LaFontaine, the wellhead protection area in the LaFontaine area is this one in the upper left hand corner. Uh, and yeah, that currently to date, that's the only one. Yeah, and then for anybody else, if there's other questions, concerns, comments, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, looking to thank all of you for joining our speakers for the great information they've sh uh, shared, um, as it's shown on this slide here. But just to, to reiterate, if you'd like to learn more about the Drinking Water Source Protection Program in general, we do have a regional uh, website. So it's dedicated only to source water, the Clean Water Act. You know, it's got the source protection plan, assessment reports, everything you'd want to know and more. Uh, that website is ourwatershed.ca. Uh, to learn more about the Severn Sound Environmental Association, uh, you can visit our website at severnsound.ca, or we are on um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, and, I, I, you know, with that, I'd like to thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and good night, everyone. <laughs>